Pal World needs no introduction. It has rapidly become one of the most talked about and successful early access game launches in recorded history, selling over 8 million copies since its sixth day of release. A Pokemon, Ark Survival, Fortnite, Zelda hybrid game that has captured the imagination of diehard Pokemon fans and game fans alike. You all know this part, so I won't waste your time with a four minute preamble leading into a two minute ad read for Raid Shadow Legends. A rather vocal portion of the internet, which is my sophisticated way of saying Twitter, are calling for the destruction of this game due to its reportedly suspicious similarities to the Pokemon franchise of games. Now, anyone with eyes could see that this game intentionally takes a little more than inspiration from Pokemon. That's not really something up for dispute. I think if pressed in a less confrontational and perhaps less sensitive point in time, I could see the dev team admitting to openly borrowing wide swaths of character iconography and stylings from Pokemon near exclusively. Don't forget to subscribe, by the way, if you like the video. Before we dive into my issues, oh my god, before we dive into how distant I am with my dad, before we dive into my issues with the sort of response this game has received, let me discuss what I feel Pal World is. Pal World is a survival crafting game that borrows wide swaths of its base content ideas from other games in its field of entry. It borrows the skill tree unlock system from Ark Survival Evolved. It borrows its hot cold system as well as the general climbing, gliding, sliding, and player navigation systems from The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. It borrows its crafting UI and build feel from Fortnite, though that one feels a little bit more generalized and if it were the sole accusation behind this game, I'd say it's relatively nebulous but considering the fact that it has several other gameplay systems I feel it's derivative of, we'll just go ahead and throw it in just to be safe. It borrowed its monster Pokedex XP system, wherein catching 10 pals of an identical type allows you to complete an entry within the game's pal deck, a stand-in for the Pokemon Pokedex, while obviously borrowing the catching monsters using throne tiered balls system from Pokemon Arceus, as well as Pokemon as a whole. The game borrows a lot of its foundational ideas, and what it amounts to is a a relatively shaky feeling survival monster catching game that is ultimately profoundly rich with content and enjoyable depending on who you ask. Crazy, right? I just accused this game of stealing the baby along with the bathwater, and I have the gall to say that I liked this game. Well, I'll go one step further than even that. I think this could be one of the best survival crafting games currently available if given the time and budget required for them to hire more talent, put more effort into their currently existing system, expand their roster of an already impressive 111 different types of pals, as well as refine and better realize their base assets, including the weirdly plastic looking base character models and janky world geometry. That said, this game does have a feel issue. You can sense that a great deal of the game's movement, animation, detail work, and fundamental aspects are all in practically an alpha state. This is acceptable considering that it's an early access game, but it is indicative of a dev team with priorities in uniquely different places. That's not a bad thing, but it lends credence to the reality that the dev team is comprised mostly of individuals highly inexperienced in shipping and developing video games. They have a few titles in their backlog, so they certainly aren't starting from zero, but I did notice some interesting balancing and design issues involving AI pathing, base design, and farming avenues, as well as a general sense of pacing problems throughout. This didn't really stop me from throwing balls around. <laughs> This didn't really stop me from throwing balls. <laughs> this didn't really stop me from throwing balls around, filling out my deck, <laughs> filling up my ass. This didn't really stop me from throwing balls around, filling out my deck, building specialized bases, fusing pals together, doing dungeons, beating and catching bosses, and all the other fun stuff that you can actually do in this game. Amidst all the systems and ideas that is openly taken from other more successful games, exists a uniquely ununique video game game that is surprisingly compelling and made from a place of which diversity of gameplay experience and interoperability of gameplay systems are at the heart of this title. Speaking of titles, Let's return to mine. Pal World is a worthless, cheap ripoff. Twitter has been pretty openly cynical regarding this game, and its positioning as a market replacement for Pokemon to most gamers. The initial allegations revolved around the use of AI generative technology to create the designs of the pals with prompts fed with Pokemon designs. We've seen AB comparisons done, demonstrating how blatant and clear the design theft goes, and how it proves to some degree AI was used in the conception of said designs. 
guns. The smoking gun believers of this perspective tend to gravitate towards is the fact that the CEO has openly posted regarding his rich interest in generative AI, alongside his studio's previous releases being a bad faith Zelda clone and a game literally titled AI, Art Imposter, a game in which you are made to tell the difference between AI generated art and real art. There's also some bad faith introspection into his character due to his interest in investment of cryptocurrencies, but that just seems to be Twitter twittering or X Xing in order to prove AI was used within the design pipeline of a game predominantly made by new and inexperienced game designers, a sentence, mind you, which sounds damning, if a bit accusatory. By the way, that was intentional, so you could see how we got here. We need to see the generated art itself, an ask which I very seriously doubt could be produced, since I doubt they kept that sort of thing around if they very well did use AI. I feel when we begin blanket accusing others of using AI, something that's a bit common in the more hardcore art drama space Places of Twitter, a place distinctly different than the actual art places of Twitter, we run into issues regarding the burden of proof. Without a lawsuit or perjury on the line, the only real evidence one can acquire regarding dishonest design practices are that which are given to us directly. So naturally, since proving AI's use would end up, oh my, AI's use, Okay, so naturally, since proving AI's use would end up being next to impossible, people gravitated towards comparing the 3D models from the recently released Pokemon games, including Arceus, Scarlet and Violet, and several others, to the one shipped out with Pal World itself. This has widely shifted the narrative towards proving Pal World has stolen its assets, or at the very least, remixed them. In order to justify the waves of initial hatred and accusational vitriol, and prove the game is a bad faith product. While many consider this to be the new and de facto smoking gun, there are developments regarding this accusation. For those of you who've kept up with all of this, I'm sure you think I'm gonna bring up the recent development that the OP who released these comparisons did some warping and stretching to make the evidence seem more damning than it really was. I won't. Because scaling, transcribing, or modifying something to get across a point of comparison, which, while done in bad faith in this instance, still isn't necessarily the issue I have with these allegations. A broad swath of people who brought forth the allegations that Pal World had stolen these models and modified them, I noticed a unique trend. If they weren't your everyday average game enthusiast, most of them seemed to be 2D artists and didn't fully understand what goes into making these designs within a 3D modeling space. You can argue that your artistic eye can can tell stolen from not stolen. Unfortunately, you're working within a legal accusation and not a good faith versus bad faith one. To steal a file would be theft. To trace a file would be theft. To pedophile, <laughs> to trace a file, modify a file, remix a file, and not resemble the original file that it was originally derived from is bad faith and lazy at worst, and somebody's actual good faith workflow at best. I don't know a damn thing about 3D modeling, so I sought posts from people who do, and had insight into how this sort of thing gets done. When the 3D modeling community took a look at some of these allegations, they noted that the polygon structure of the characters simply didn't rem- oh my- Oh God, okay. When the 3D modeling community took a look at some of these allegations, they noted that the polygon structures of these characters simply didn't resemble those of the Pokemon ones. What this means is, while you can warp, stretch, augment files all you want, without rebuilding the polygon structures and pattern shape points, you'll always be able to tell that something was stolen and remixed. When comparing Pal World and Pokemon, this very thing didn't emerge, meaning someone went in by hand and from the ground up created the shapes that we see on the PAL world models. When presented with this fact, the most common de facto response that I saw was, well, sure, but then it's traced and it's in bad faith. The truth keeps emerging. They dislike that the game's designs are done in bad faith. They will do anything from accusing the devs to using AI, to accusing the devs of stealing 3D models, to accusing the devs of attacking the World Trade Center. <laughs> I can't put that in. Let's swing back to the title one more time. Pal World is a worthless, cheap, ripoff. Is it a ripoff? It uses bits and pieces and ideas that Pokemon have coined and did it in a pretty shameless way. It relies on parody and its other genre conventions to dilute the core Pokemon gameplay formula and point by solving the gameplay issue the series has had its entire life. 
What do you do when you've caught all the Pokemon? You be happy. You hunt shiny variants. You wait for the next one, right? Well, not in POW world. In POW world, you make them do slave labor. Slave labor, mind you, which makes the survival aspects on the other half of the game more streamlined and enjoyable. It's like Satisfactory had a baby with Ark. You're fighting for your life while also optimizing how you do that very thing with resources and refining materials and so on and so on. This distinctly unique spin on the monster catching formula makes powered, powered? Powered. <laughs> this distinctly unique spin on monster catching makes POW World uniquely its own spin, meaning it's harder to authentically and succinctly call it a ripoff since it has its own identity and perspective within the genre. I can't even call it a cheap depiction either, because while it was made by a team with shoddy experience at best, they still created a compelling and well-rounded gameplay loop revolving around monster catching that nobody, even a multi-billion dollar company, could crack the code with. Explaining why people are playing it still, despite the fact it seemed like a flash in the pan meme at the expense of Pokemon and Nintendo. So cheap ripoff? Hardly. Worthless? It costs less than half the price of the supposed best of the best Pokemon entry according to Game Freak, so it's definitely not that. So what are we left with in my title? Power World is. Well, to be fair, it would actually be Power World is A, but like just, just if you're willing to drop the A, I'm willing to drop the A. Power World is fun. It's uncreative, it's spotty, it's a little artistically bankrupt, but it innovates in fun and interesting ways. It's Pokemon with guns, but it's also a Pokemon game we've never seen and would never get. POW World is a mechanical joy while being an aesthetic robbery. If the latter bothers you, I get why you wouldn't bother touching it with a 40-foot pole. But if the former excites you, it's genuinely just an absolute joy and is a game I really do hope gets its chance to walk in the sun, no matter how obvious they stole this Eevee design. I couldn't find a good place to bring this up in the video, but I kind of randomly wanted to throw this in. I've noticed a thing in gaming all coin as baby's first Unreal Engine project effect. It's when dudes who first experiment with Unreal Engine recreate their favorite childhood games with absurd amounts of bloom and shine effects everywhere using the Unreal Engine. Think Sonic, Zelda, Mario, Pokemon? I've noticed these tech demos get a great deal of affection and attention by the gaming community. In fact, the recent Sonic title, Sonic Frontiers, feels very much like this sort of project, expanded into the scope of a full game, where in exchange for unique and identifying art, the game is supplemented with slick, shiny surfaces glistening against the camera, and Sonic is given full speed to run around an open, obstacle-free environment to both simulate the raw speed and also allow for open terrain freedom. It has this strange hyper beauty, tech demo-like quality, and ops for bells and whistles graphically instead of art consistency and cohesion. This isn't a bad thing. In fact, the BFUEP effect, <laughs> in fact, this effect has seemingly always been in vogue and something gamers have wanted forever. Hyper-realistic graphics contrasted against high saturation and almost mochi-like designs from classic Nintendo and mascot-oriented games of the past. It's why people gave so much of a crap about Nintendo's Link's Awakening remake, even from game fans who had no experience with the series, much less the game itself. It's a cool look. So yeah, that's it. Video's over. Fucking subscribe.